This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts, as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. To Euro Graps Express, I'm your host Neil David and we are back once again to talk about all the exciting events on the British and European wrestling scene. I've just made quite a big mistake and, and this is really my own fault, I, you know, there's no one to blame here but me, but I've just opened my phone and logged on to Twitter, which is just a mistake these days, isn't it? Isn't it amazing to think that Twitter used to be this integral part of being a wrestling fan? Or at least it felt like it did. And I know there's probably somebody listening to this saying, well, not for me. But when I was getting into writing about wrestling and starting the podcast and, you know, getting into the voice as a wrestling crew, and it, it just felt like a really important thing to be on. Like I had to be on it for engagement and, and, and to be in the know and to find out about things. But now it just feels like a burden, doesn't it? It feels like something that hangs over you. <laughs> like, it's just, I have to be on it, but I don't really want to be. The only good thing about it is there's, you know, a few people who DM occasionally, like, you know, people who become friends, and, you know, that, that's how we, we keep in touch, is, is through Twitter and chat about wrestling, but that's about it. So, yeah, I've made this mistake of opening my phone uh, and looking at Twitter, and OTT are doing some match announcements for their show in Wolverhampton, which I was seriously thinking about going to. You know, Wolverhampton's not that far away from me. I think I could do the drive in a couple of hours. Um, never been, you know, even when Fight Club Pro were doing their stuff down there, I never I never drove down. Um, and I saw a, gra- a match graphic and John Moxley was on it. And I, I'm a big, big advocate. I'm not the only person, but I'm a big, big advocate for seeing great professional wrestlers live. Even if the match announced isn't necessarily an an amazing one, an exciting one, you've still got to go and see these greats because there's something completely different about that live experience. Wrestling is a live medium and I'm a, a bit of a grumpy fella, to be honest with you. I think you picked up on this by now. I don't really like leaving my house uh, when I do go to a wrestling uh, wrestling show, 90% of the time I go on my own. Could go with my wife. I could, you know, if I grabbed an extra ticket, I've got a couple of mates who enjoy some live wrestling, even if they don't watch it sort of week in, week out. I could go with other people, but I just much, much prefer to go on my own. I don't know what it is. And I like to sit at the back. And as soon as that last bell goes, I bounce. So even with that context, even with somebody who, you know, leaving the house is not something they enjoy, seeing certain wrestlers live is just an honour and a privilege and you just get things so much more. Like somebody like Minoru Suzuki, who is obviously a next level wrestler on tape, you know, he's not somebody who, (laughs) you know, needs that live experience to get over, but there's something about him walking past you, there's something about him shouting, uh, shouting Kaze Nina Ray, along with his theme tune, that just makes things make so much more sense, I mean, to the point where, I've even been to see Minoru Suzuki wrestle Joe Coffey for What Culture Pro Wrestling, I think I've told this story before, but I remember, Minoru Suzuki coming out and Kaze Nina Ray had started and I was with my cousin my cousin had agreed to come for some reason and we're getting really into it we're really enjoying you know the entrance music we're clapping along and Kaze Nina Ray is coming up and I stand up and I, again not like me this but it's Suzuki isn't it but I stand up I point my fingers in the air like a half Daniel Bryan yes and shout Kaze Nina and before I get to the narre, 
I realised that I'm the only person doing this. I've, I don't know what it was about that crowd, but none of them seemed to know who Minoru Suzuki was. And El Desperado was on that show as well, and they'd all bought El Desperado ma- uh, um, masks. And he was super over. Everybody loved him, but I got the impression they just liked him because he's got an amazing look. No one knew who he was. And actually, that's the only show I've ever been to where I have walked out before the final bell. And it was Cody Rhodes against Kurt Angle. And this was when Cody Rhodes was in his list era. And I've I've gone back and forth on Cody Rhodes so much as a wrestler. Like, when he left WWE to go away and do his own thing, I you have to respect that, don't you? Someone who turns his, his back on what would essentially have been a job for life, I suppose, and who was already rich, who was doing for but thought, no, I want to go away and I want to do something significant. And he did, you know, forming AEW and being a huge part of that. And yet... I look at the actual work and I don't like it. You know, his big thing with Anthony Ogogo in AEW, I thought was was bad. Um, breaking Triple H's throne, I thought was awful. Uh, but yeah, this match against Kurt Angle was one of the worst things I've ever seen. They were doing cartwheels and the 10 chant. This was when Sean Spears, I can't remember his name in NXT, but it was when he was in NXT, and the 10 chant was absolutely massive. And for some reason, they were doing the 10 chant. And I looked at my cousin and I just said, should we go and get the car? Because this is in Altrincham. And if you've ever been to a show at the Altrincham Ice Rink, it's a bit tricky getting your car out. You know, if if you're late, there's sort of one little road and we just thought, you know what, we'll beat the traffic. I don't need to see this. Um, But... Yeah, that, but yeah, go and see wrestlers live. You know, you you got to get that experience. So I'm, I've never seen John Moxley. But John Moxley, I, I see, I see his, his face on this match graphic, and I think I've, I've got to go and see John Moxley. And I'm thinking in that split second, it doesn't matter who's on the other side of that match graphic. You know, if I've seen Minoru Suzuki against Joe Coffey, Joe Coffey, then it doesn't matter who's on. I'll just go and see it, and I'll, I'll enjoy that Moxley aura because i know he's got that you know what i said about that live wrestler thing that special intangible thing that great live wrestlers have or great wrestlers i should say because it's just a live medium but the person he's wrestling against is trent seven and i think ott have managed to find the line They've managed to find the line that would stop me going to see a wrestler who I am absolutely desperate to tick off. I really, really want to go and see John Moxley, but the idea of watching Trent Seven in 2023, I'll be honest with you, is a little bit too much for me. I don't know if I can cope with that at this point. Every time I've seen Trent Seven, I've been disappointed. And I get the idea that he's competent at his corny comedy shtick. But I I think there's two levels to it. I think, one, the corny comedy shtick, as competent as he is at it, it's not, for me, it's not entertaining. You know, I don't understand it. In fact, I remember once seeing him. It was the Fight Club Pro Dream Tag Team Invitational. Uh, And they did did a show in Manchester at the Academy, and I went to see it. And... For, he came out before the show and for some reason decided to do this weird monologue. I think, uh, you know, a lot of promotions were doing this and uh, it comes from the progress thing and that's fine, whatever. But it was rambling. It was weird. It wasn't funny. But I'm surrounded by some like 21-year-olds who are laughing their heads off at it. And it wasn't, I don't get it. It was like having a laugh track but performed by people. <laughs> I can't, you know, that's a weird kind of postmodernism that I'm getting into. But yeah, it's just really weird. So I think OTT should be congratulated for finding the one person they could book against John Moxley that I don't want to go and see. 
Uh, but there's been lots of happiness that have happened this week. They've, uh, Voices of Wrestling have announced their um, top 100 matches of the year. Uh, well, it's more than top 100, isn't it? They, they go right back. Everyone who gets a vote gets on the list. And obviously, they make a bigger deal out of the top 100. Um, but the the match of the year list has been bigger than ever this year. 208 voters, 23 countries, 372 matches, 70 different promotions. And this, to me... And, you know, you can think I'm biased, you can think, you know, because obviously this podcast is on the Voices of Wrestling Podcasting Network, I write for them, I've been a member of that site as a as a contributor for a long, long time. But to me, this is the best match of the year list out there. I think what's great about it is that it, it's completely open to anybody in wrestling media. So as long as you're someone who likes wrestling enough to have taken that next step to start writing about it or podcasting about it. You're somebody who's dedicated yourself to watching as much wrestling as you can and finding the good bits and criticising the bad bits. Tell Voices of Wrestling what you thought your best matches were. And what that means is it's this amazing list of you know, people who are deep, deep into Puro, people who are the Joshy guys, people like me who are going to vote for the British and European side of things, you know, are fine, more likely to find the British and European side of things. Um, you know, you've got people from Uruguay, New Zealand, Norway, Kuwait, all these different places that, that are represented on this poll. And I think what it means is that if you're the sort of rest, wrestling fan who wants to see the have a snapshot of the best wrestling of that year, I don't think there's a better place to find it. And I'm always really interested in that sort of feeling. I like going back, you know, like the Good Helmet compilations, almost like the Zeitgeist tapes, Zeitgeist tapes of a year. And that's different because it's not necessarily the, necessarily the best, it's just the most significant. But if you want to get a snapshot of what that year was in wrestling, you know, good helmet compilations are the way to go. But if you want a snapshot of what the greatest matches were that year, I don't think you can get better than the Voices of Wrestling poll because it's not gonna. There's not gonna be a particular tangent. There's not gonna be a particular overriding viewpoint that takes control of the list. And I'm not criticizing that. I mean, that's fine. If you vote in the Wrestling Observer poll, there's gonna be generally a. a, a are leaning towards the kind of wrestlers that wrestling observer people like. And that's fine because you got that that's a weird criticism that people have that that's somehow a bad thing. You know, that that's obviously going to be what that poll represents. But I think in terms of being open and being free and giving you the best picture of the of the ma- best matches that year, I don't think you're going to get any better than the voices of wrestling poll. You could obviously go on the website and, and find the um, uh, and find everything, all three hundred and odd matches. You can you, there's a if you're on the Patreon, they did some great audio breaking down those matches. But what I thought it would be interesting to do for this podcast is obviously to go through and have a look at the British and European matches that were on there uh, and talk about what I think of them. Um, now there aren't, if I'm honest that many matches in the poll <laughs> you know it, i've not gone back yet and had a look at how it compares to previous years but we've got one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven matches which you know okay i i, I think's fine you know I, I don't think that's bad i suppose 12 if you count clash in the castle but I, I didn't that came 11th by the way um, the Gunther versus Sheamus match, but I, I I didn't put that on there because I just thought, ooh, you know, I I, I don't that it's an American promotion and a big part of what they're doing is based on the fact that they're based in America and they're over here. So I don't think we can really um, include that as much as it as much as I'm I'm desperate as you can hear I'm I'm desperately trying to. Um, so we've got a few matches. It's a mix of Red Pro, Progress, WXW, and a couple of other promotions. Uh, but I thought, yeah, let's go through them from the bottom, and we'll talk about whether I think they deserve to be on there, whether I think they deserve to be higher. What I what I think of these matches, basically. 
So the lowest rated European match was uh, Dan Maloney against Mark True for Purpose Wrestling. Um, he got one tenth place vote. And long time <laughs> listeners of the show will obviously know that that one came from me. Now, I know a lot of people use that 10th place as a spot to highlight a match that they think deserves to be on the list. And it's kind of become known as the vanity pick over the last few years. And I'm not sure I like that terminology, even though that's kind of what I'm doing here. I don't think people mean it in a bad way, but it kind of suggests that it's this is about me. You know, this is about me wanting to show off that I found a deep cut and, you know, this is about a match that I think is interesting but doesn't really deserve to be on the list. Uh, I don't think that at all with this match. I don't want people to think it's a vanity pick in that sense. A lot of my list, I vote with my heart. Um, And in my head, I know that probably something like you know, Shingo Osprey that didn't make my list, you know, yeah, maybe from if I completely remove myself from the match that I'm watching, it would have beaten this match. But then as soon as I say that, I just think, well, why would I remove myself? Why would I remove my gaze and my, what my you know, my lens from my analysis of this match? And what I loved about this match so much is that I'd not heard of Mark True, I barely knew Purpose Wrestling, and they had a match that had me on the edge of my seat. And what this match gave me was that wonderful feeling of discovery, that wonderful feeling that I was getting in on something at the ground up and something underground and independent. You know, wrestling that's held in art space, which is basically a library that that he's, he's burgeoning and bubbling and, and he's, he's, he's going to move on to bigger and better things and I'm seeing it at its inception and I'm seeing people absolutely dedicated to having great matches. And yes, the match on its own was great. In a vacuum, you you know, you ignore everything, all of that other stuff, it, it deserves to be raved about anyway. But then when you add that feeling onto it that you're part of it in a weird way and you, you let your heart kind of take the match in, it just elevates it so much. And this is a match that I've raved about. It's kind of been my um, hidden gem of the year. It's one that I was... We do, you know, the Secret Santa on Voices of Wrestling where we all recommend a match to each other in secret. And I knew this was going to be my match to whoever I got because I just I just wanted more people to see it. And I hope that it being on this list, more people do get to see it. And again, that's a great thing about the list, isn't it? There's, there's matches on here that I've not seen. There's matches on here that I, I know I really want to go away and see. Like I watched the um, Duke Kasai El Desperado match because it was on this list. And I never would have watched something like that generally speaking you know so if you're listening to this and you've not seen that match it's available for free on youtube go and watch it i really recommend it next one we had was fuminori abe against masha slamovic um this was 301 this was uh at the w w x w shows that they do in a warehouse um i mean this got one ninth place vote so maybe you know I mean, this match was fine. It wasn't one that I remember, to be honest with you. I had to go back and watch it, which was a bit of a pain now that WXW now has moved over to YouTube. Um, I, I'm used to it now. I, I, I think I prefer it, but we're going to talk about that later on, actually, so I won't do that now. Um, this match was really good. You know, it's, it's intergender, which, you know, okay, I know people have different feelings about that, so that's just something to be aware of when you go into it, I suppose. Um it was a good 10-minute match. You know, I like the intimate atmosphere when the WXW do shows in their training area and you've just got kind of one row of people stood around the ring um, and it just gives things a really intimate atmosphere. But they're obviously a very dedicated wrestling crowd, a very passionate wrestling crowd. Um, lots of snap mares in this match. You know, Abe likes a snapmare and so does Slamovic. And they were doing constant snapmares and kicking each other. Um, but yeah, I think that's this match is okay. If I think if you've got WXW now, it's probably worth going out and seeking. But it's not one that I, I would have thought of for this list. Our next European match at 301. Um, so same as the previous match, you got one ninth place vote. Was Charlie Evans against Cara Noir for resurgence. I haven't seen this match. 
And I thought Resurgence were on IWTV. So I went on there to try and find this show and I've, I've not been able to find it. Um, so I don't know if I, I don't know if this is any good. Um, I can't really comment on a match that I've not seen and are not able to see. It doesn't really... Ex- I, <laughs> you know, let me phrase it another way. I wasn't overly disappointed when I couldn't find this match. You know, I Cara Noir, I think he stinks. I, I, I don't get them at all. I, I think he makes a lot more sense in DDT than he does now. And I know a lot of people who are watching DDT and seeing him for the first time are like, hey, this guy's pretty good. He's not, is he? He's rubbish. He's, he's cringy, awful. Uh, Charlie Evans, I think, is about as average as it gets. So I, I don't know. Maybe, again, this was a, a bit of a live bump. I don't know anything about it. But if, if anyone does find a way to watch it, let me know, because I, I feel like I should. This next match at number 270, I'm absolutely kicking myself about this one because I completely forgot about it. And it's Gabe Kidd against Akira. And I'm wondering if I'd have remembered this match, would it have made my list? Because I really, really loved it. This was Red Pro. Um, Was it Epic Encounters? I think it was. Um, And they just absolutely beat the living daylights out of each other, didn't they? battered each other from pillar to post, slapped each other silly. I really, really, really enjoyed this match. And like I say, I I haven't gone back and rewatched it because I think if I do, I'd be, like I say, kicking myself to thinking that this should have been on my list. I remember thinking that match, it was brilliant. And I, I, I... I'm, I'm so annoyed to myself. I was annoyed to myself when I looked at the list yesterday when I was putting this section together. And I'm kicking myself even more now because that was a great match. Uh, here's, a, here's a bit of irony for you. Matched with it at 270, equal in the eyes of the wrestling world, was that Cara Noir against Spike Treve match. Now, those who don't remember that match, this was the match for me where I stopped watching progress. This was the match where I I said, I can't do this anymore. And I've been a progress fan since the beginning. You know, I followed them all the way through. Even when they sold the soul to the WWE, I kept watching them. Even when they were bought and turned into a travel agency, I kept watching them. Even when I was watching Charles Crowley and Lana Austin in 55-hour shows with on-the-nose, boring show titles, being patronised by Simon Miller with his awful Reddit humour in an empty arena, I kept watching progress. I muddled through, I powered through. Because I had a bit of loyalty and a bit of dedication. But it was this match that made me go, no more. I can't do it. This was the match where Spike Treve set out to expose the facade that was Karen Noir. And there was a trampoline involved. Fairly sure fake blood. It was abysmal, this match. And it was one of those matches where I realised there was a real divide between me and the Progress fan now. I think I think this has always been true of Progress. I think Progress have always had their own fans. And yes, there's wrestling fans that would go as well. You know, because people like me, I'm a fan of wrestling. I don't have a particular allegiance to companies. I... I, I Stick with them. You know, I, I I like to take companies through low points and hope they get back up there. But I don't... I'm not particularly particularly loyal to a company. And Progress has a lot of people that are loyal to that company. There are a lot of people, certainly during their heyday, who would watch Progress. They weren't fans of wrestling. They were fans of Progress. And that's... Not something to be sniffed at, by the way. I think that's a, a, a great achievement. But that's kind of all they've got left now. And to the modern progress fan, this is the epitome of what they want. It's 
overdrawn, it's overly dramatic, it's, you know, quote, telling a story. It's almost like it's it's a match that you can pretend is great. And maybe if you if you don't watch any other wrestling, if the only wrestling you watch is progress, then maybe this this was great. But I'm gonna put this as one of my worst matches of the year. I've not done that list, by the way. That would be a bit mean. But this is one of the worst matches of the year. And there was some insane bumps in this. I remember the... I've not rewatched this, by the way, so this is all from memory. I remember that insane Car Noir jump where they set up a load of tables and he leapt over too far and instead of landing on the table, he just smashed his head off the back of it as his bum hit the floor. And I... A bit of a sicko about that sort of thing, but I always... That always bumps a match for me. If people are doing sick, insane bumps, that always gives it a little bit extra for me. But it couldn't overcome the trampoline. It couldn't overcome the trampoline. Was there lemon juice in this one? Pro, This was the year of lemon juice for progress. It seemed like that was something that they were doing all the time. Like they'd get out the thumbtacks and then the lemon juice, which, you know, unbelievable. Anyway, I mean to say that was as good as Akira against Kid. I think that that's a real <laughs> line in the sand there, isn't it, for wrestling? Another progress one at one eight four oh one two one Sunshine Machine against Smoking Aces. I did see this match. I can't go back and watch it now. They've taken everything off the network, and I feel bad enough subscribing to the network. So I'm certainly not going to subscribe to Progress's on demand service. Uh, yeah, this was good. I, I like this match. I think this was this was significantly better than Noir against Dreve. I I like all of those teams a lot better outside of progress. I think all of those teams are better served outside of progress, especially Smoking Aces. I feel like when Smoking Aces are in progress, they tend to get a little bit too entrance heavy. You know, they tend to get a bit too on the nose with things and a little bit too practiced and almost like their entrances are are thought of backstage whereas when they work in Red Pro they tend to be a little bit more fluid, more natural Um, so I I much prefer them elsewhere now the next one at 147 is a match that I really did want to see Um, out of sick curiosity more than anything else but Chris Brooks against Kid Lycos I've never really understood the Chris Brooks thing. You know, I I wrote in a lot of reviews that I would book him if I was a promoter, but I didn't really know why, you know, from a creative point of view. But it seemed like for that time, especially during the start of NXT UK, every show you went to had Chris Brooks on. And every show there was maybe 10 or 15 people in the audience decked head to toe in Chris Brooks merchandise who'd clearly come to see him. And that, you know, yeah, 10 or 15 tickets, okay. But when you've got 200 people there, that's a a, a fair percentage. He pays for himself, I suppose. Um, And I always thought Chris Brooks was okay. I think what it is, is Chris Brooks and Lycos subscribe to a, a type of wrestling that I just don't really enjoy, that irony wrestling. You know, when they used to do the Tuesday night graps at the Frog and Bucket in Manchester, and I just couldn't bring myself to go it just wasn't something for me but I am told by several people that this match is really good so if if I ever find a way to watch it I will but I'm not giving progress any money Um, 104 then just before the list proper we've got Abe and Shigehiro against uh, Dreisker and Icarus from the WXW Tag League Um, this got so high because it actually got a first place vote so this was somebody's match of the year. And again, that speaks to how good this poll is. You know, somebody who is, if you're watching WXW, you're clearly in um, the wrestling world, aren't you? Do you know what I mean? So it's, it, it, you know, th- this match obviously lit a fire under somebody. And it is really, really good. I really enjoyed it. Um, I bet I'm a little bit hit, hit and miss about. I know people in WXW really like him. I find him a bit samey. I think it's just lots of snapmares and kicks. He doesn't, you know, the character grabs me and captivates me, 
but after a while that wears off. It was interesting this one because it was very heel versus face a lot of the a lot of the way through. Um the Ambos thing I'm not a huge fan of. Um it's that whole we want wrestling to be the way it should be, but then just wrestle like heels, which I don't really get. But there was lots and lots of cool spots in this. Like Abbey Pile drives Icarus into Dreisker, you know, into his partner, which I thought was really interesting. Um and it's one of those tag matches that breaks down brilliantly. You know, when it goes from that you know, the hot tag traditional structure and then it breaks down into chaos and they did this really well and it had a pace that that I thought was phenomenal. This is uh, is a match that I really would recommend. Again, not a match that I would consider for a match of the year list. I mean, clearly one person did. They thought it was amazing. But I'm I'm really glad they've reminded me of it because I'd forgotten about it, to be honest with you. It's not a match that I... I I mean, I'd seen it, but I I just hadn't remembered it. And I I, I think it's a shame because it is really, really good. Into the match proper then. Uh, Into the match proper, sorry. Into the list proper. We're into the top 100. And there's three matches in the top 100. And I will let you guess what promotion they're from. Rev Pro, obviously. You know, two points to you because I'm sure you got it right. Um... Uh, Red Pro had a, had, a, had a bit of a mixed year for me. I, I don't think it was a classic year from Red Pro. It, it wasn't firing on all cylinders um, for reasons we discussed at nauseum, so I'm not going to go back into that. But you know with Red Pro, you're always going to have a couple of matches that belong on a list like this. You know, a couple of matches that you can put up against any promotion in the world and say... What have you done on this level? And there's a couple of matches on here that I don't think any promotion in Europe has come close to sniffing this year. You know, this Red Pro, for the work rate fan, for the wrestling fan, really is where the great matches are. Um, I think a lot of the issue is that it's it's drowning in a lot of rubbish at the minute. You know, from a booking point of view, Red Pro feels very stagnant. They're booking the same sort of people over and over again and not doing anything exciting with them. But these three matches, I think, speak for themselves. And it's a range as well. There's 97, 73 and 13 in terms of placement. So they've, they've done really, really well. And actually, I'll say this now. One of the criticisms that they get a lot is that is a weird one, you know, that, yeah, Red Pro only have great matches because they book Osprey a lot. And for one, that's a very strange criticism to have. You know, it's like, oh, yeah, Manchester United only won the football match because they scored the most goals. You know, it's like, what are you, what are you talking about? <laughs> like, they booked the best wrestler in the country and he had great matches, you know. Um, but also the criticism that they can only do it because of Osprey doesn't really make any sense because we've got three here in the top 100 and only one of them features Osprey. Obviously, it's the best one, but, you know, it's not... They're still head and shoulders above everybody else, even without Osprey. So, 92, right at the bottom, was a match I considered for my own list and it was a match I saw live. It was the banger in Manchester, Oku against Jacobs, where Jacobs won the, um, the Cruiserweight Championship. I'm wondering with this match whether my view of it is slightly tainted by what's happened afterwards. That they've really messed up this cruiserweight division needlessly. You know, it's been booked so badly and in such and, and Jacob's story has been sold in such a confusing way, whether he's going to be heavyweight or stay as a cruiserweight. It, it kind of mars things a little bit, but I remember at the mo- in the moment seeing this match, getting quite emotional about it in a weird way because I was really critical of Luke Jacobs and in a way that I hoped was positive. You know, in a way that I was basically saying that, look, Jacobs clearly is a special talent. He's clearly fantastic, but he's just missing that great match. You know, he was getting four-star matches. He'd occasionally flirt with four and a quarter, but he was starting to establish himself as a wrestler that had a ceiling. And... It, it felt a little bit unfair to criticise him of this because he's very, very young. Um, he tr- was traditionally a tag team wrestler. He was only having this singles run because Ethan Allen got injured. 
So there was lots of other factors that made me second guess whether I should be so critical about him. But once this match happened, I realised that this was the match I'd been waiting for for him. This was the great match. And yet he had Michael Oker in there with him. And yes, I was there live, which might have given it a bump. But to me, I don't think their excuses. I don't think that you can take away from a match because of that, because it was what it was. Again, the booking thing, you booked him against Oku, you get credit for booking a good match, you know, and it was a great match. And I remember seeing him with the belt, thinking it was great. I remember walking home along the Keys, uh, because I I can walk from Victoria Warehouse to my house, and I walked through the Keys at night, looking at the dirty old town of Salford, which I love, high on the fact that I'd watched a great wrestling match. You know, I, I, I thought this was an absolutely brilliant match and one that I recommend seeking out. At 73, it was Aussie Open against Velocities. Isn't it weird out this? They had a few matches this year in Red Pro and, and those were matches that I was really excited about. You know, hearing from our Australian friends about the matches Aussie Open and Velocities were having over there and how great they were, and watching the ones that made tape, and they were brilliant matches. And getting excited to have them over here and get to see them over here. And seeing how great they were, it's strange that they've almost been forgotten in a way. I don't see many people talking about them. But it must they must have stuck in people's heads because this one um, hit is the 73rd best match of the year. And I think sometimes, actually, that's a point. With a list like this, because you've got 100 matches, I think sometimes it's easy to sort of sneer and say, well, yeah, it's 73rd, it's low down the list. But out of how many matches is that? It's the 73rd, in what percentile would that be? Top 1% worldwide? I mean, I don't know. Maths isn't my strong suit. But it, it it's clearly done very very well and stuck in people's minds and it you know it got first place votes you know this match um it's got a nine on cage match 4.5 from dave Meltzer, and i really liked it these two rest uh, teams wrestle really smartly velocities are a lot smaller than aussie open and they have to they worm their way out of things they ease their way out they you know they they yeah get overpowered from time to time and get those big bumps in but then they also have to wrestle smart, and I, I thought this one, this was from the London show. This it was it Epic Encounters. This one, I think it was. I can't remember off the top of my head because there was two. The one in Manchester wasn't anywhere near as good, and I was there live for that one as well. So that you know should have perhaps had a bump. Um, I think there was a really awkward injury early on, and I'll never forget it. I can't remember which velocity it was, ironically, but Mark Davis threw him into the corner, and he just landed back first onto the ring post. And the bruise on his back and the bump itself just looked horrendous. And I think that really threw the match off. You know, I think there was was an injury there. Um, But that first one was great. Uh, The best match of the year that happened on European soil, probably of no surprise to anyone, I'm actually somewhat surprised that this was so low. Um, It was my number two of the year, and it's Oku against Osprey. The match that made me want to start podcasting. The match that I used as an excuse to get into this game. This match ticks all boxes for me. It was perfect from a work rate point of view. From a storyline point of view, it was absolutely stellar you know the idea your know, oku screaming at um uh, sorry um, osprey screaming at his girl uh, amira amira blair oku's girlfriend you know considering throwing in the towel for him and all, and all that stuff there's those little moments of story that were really easy to make corny and cheesy but they managed to pull this off amazingly in this match and obviously from a work rate point of view you've got osprey who is you know his 2022 he was the best best wrestler of the year I don't think there's any argument for anybody else, really. The only people who you could argue 
had some of their best work with Osprey. He's a common denominator that kind of links them all together. And I think Oku has had an absolutely fantastic year. One of the things that gets forgotten about this match as well is kind of that media tour that Oku went on afterwards. You know, he got five stars from Dave Meltzer and a lot of people were talking about it. And it it got... He sort he sort of went round and just promoted Red Pro and became a bit of an ambassador for Red Pro and I think that was a really great thing for him to do, a really worthwhile and valuable thing for him to do. Like I say, I am quite surprised and I don't know if I should be that this is so low at thirty. I mean, I say low; it's the thirteenth best match of the year, which is amazing. I wonder if maybe there's a recency bias thing, you know, because this happened end of Jan. It was you know this time last year around. I, I wonder if maybe that has affected its placement a little bit. You know, there are matches that people thought of that, you know, just are more fresh in their mind, I suppose. Um, but to me, it was it was one of the first matches I thought of, so maybe not. Um, so my list, my full list was uh, 10, Maloney against True. At 9, I did Osprey against Okada from the G1. And I'm seeing a lot of really weird debate about this one. A lot of people think that the G1 absolutely smokes the Wrestle Kingdom match. And a lot of people think that the Wrestle Kingdom match absolutely smoked the G1 match. Um, I've got both on my top 10, but I've got Wrestle Kingdom match higher, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, number eight, Aussie Open against FTR. Um, again, this is a New Japan match. I know it happened in London, but I, I just thought that was a, a really great match. Um, Osprey against Zack Sabre Jr., two British wrestlers. I'm always going to vote I'm all well. I'm not always going to vote for it, but they're always going to word my vote, aren't they? Because it's absolutely amazing. Um, I'd had Sheamus against Gunther at number six, another match that happened on British soil. Just great hard hitting match. I had Briscoe's FTR at number five. Then I had the Wrestle Kingdom match, Osprey versus Okada at number four. Um, I just thought the stakes were a little bit higher. I think the big, even though you know, no crowd and all that. It just, it felt like a little bit of a bigger event to me, which which is what bumped it up. Third was Anarchy in the, Anarchy in the Arena. I love that. I talked about that last week, didn't I? Just that I, that image of, 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 of uh, Eddie Kingston walking to the ring with a can of petrol in his hand and the look of uh, Brian Danielson of like, what the hell are you doing? And then they just start fighting. I love the whole match, but that was the bit that got that over for me. I, I I thought that was great. And then my number two, as I've talked about, Oku versus Osprey. And my number one match um, was the dog collar match, uh, the Briscoe FTR dog collar match, um, which was my number one. I, I wrote this list before we got the terrible news of Jay Briscoe's death, um, you know, nothing to do with that. I, I, I just thought it was pheno- a phenomenal match. You know, the kind of match that I'd like to talk about, but for some reason, I've chosen to do a British and European wrestling podcast. Um, so, on that note, we should probably talk about some British and European wrestling. We're going to talk about the WXW Joint Show with Body Slam Wrestling. I've been meaning to check out Body Slam Wrestling for so long. Ever since I started doing this podcast and I I started talking to people um, and asking for recommendations of matches and things like that, Body Slam are always one that's come up. I've always had some very passionate people say, look, you need to check out Body Slam Wrestling. They're a Danish company. um, And I've never talked about them before because a lot of their stuff makes tape, but it takes a long time for it to make tape. So you'll be looking at a event that's just uploaded and it, you'll realise that it's kind of like, I don't know, you're six months old. You know, something, it's not just a little bit, you know, it, it's kind of way, way, way out of date. And it's, I, I just don't really feel comfortable reviewing things that are quite that old. Um, but, you know that is what it is, and and but they've had this this joint show with WXW, and I was really excited because essentially what that's done is it's given me the opportunity to have a, a good look at this promotion and see what they're all about. So this is my first experience of Body Slam Wrestling. So it happened on the fourteenth of Jan, 
It was in Denmark, which I was really glad about, actually, because I want to see the home body slam crowd. You know, it's strange, isn't it, when you're trying to get a feel for a promotion. And these joint shows are great and something that WXW seem to do quite a lot, you know, that they, they'll they do shows with a, with another promotion. And I, I, I really enjoyed that. I think that's great. The first match we had was Bobby Guns against Emeritus. Emeritus, I think it's pronounced. Now, Emeritus is someone who you see quite a lot on um, Body Slam posters and Body Slam promotional material. Um, Bobby Guns is obviously an old WXW favourite, you know, I, I, one that I've, I've liked for a while. Um, I can't hear his name without thinking of that Julie Chan match. You remember that? Guns! Bobby Guns! Ilya Guns! Bobby Guns, ill, yeah. I like the fact it's got, like, can any musician out there tell me what, what rhythm that's in? You know, because I don't think it's in 4-4, four, four, is it? Guns, Bobby Guns, ill, yeah. It's in 3-3-3, three, 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 isn't it? Oh, never mind, whatever. I thought it was like my sugar, like it was going to be in like 9-12 or something, yeah? and then a bar of whatever. You know, some really, uh, like, polyrhythmic thing, but no, it's just 3-3. Three, three. I like it anyway. Um... This match was was um was was not good if if I'm honest with you. Um the 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 grappling at the start was really awkward. It was very slow. Um it felt very assisted in some ways like um Emeritus was trying to do things that were a little bit beyond their ability. <coughs> you know, for excuse me, <coughs> you know things like um trying to jump up onto the head and, and flip out of things, which was fine, but they couldn't do them quick enough to make them convincing, um, which, which really took away from things. Uh, Guns was great in this. I think Guns took control and was definitely the veteran here and definitely was the better wrestler. And he was really able to take control and work through this match to make it competent. You know, the way you worked the limb was fantastic. And actually, Emeritus, I, I, I pronounced his name about 15 different ways, so I apologise. But one of the things about Emeritus that I thought was was great was their babyface charisma. And to me, that really overcame a lot of the shortcomings in the work because he's not the best worker in the world. But as he's getting beaten down, even through the mask, you can see that baby face fire and passion really coming through and I was the crowd were behind him and I couldn't help but get behind him in that sense. You know, he was a, very much a whirlwind, very much something that kind of t took me along with him. It was super slow, to be honest with you, and that was the point. And th there was this thing where Emiratus tried to do this dive through the bottom rope grab him by the head and, and twist him round and uh, into sort of a ddt and it was so slow it was it was comical it's a spot that was done so badly that i don't understand why it's in his repertoire you know he ran towards the rope he basically got on his knees stopped and then crawled his way out of the ring i i, I just think that that that's something that's not, you know, if you if if you're gonna do something that badly, then you shouldn't be doing it at all. Really, I think that that had a little, that really took away from the match. Next up, we had Robert Dreisker against Bam Bam Quad. Uh, the arrows of Hungary were out for this because obviously Robert Dreisker and the arrows of of of, of joined forces. They're now an, they're an evil heel tag team trying to bring balance to wrestling or whatever it is they're trying to do, um, and they're terrifying. I love you know what we really should do. We should do another deep dive on Hungarian wrestling, shouldn't we? It was about this time last year when we did it. I think it was kind of early on in the podcast. So yeah, we should go back and have a, see what HCW are up to because if I'm honest, I've fallen behind on them. Um, Arrows are absolutely badass. And the Easy Lovers, which is this sort of other team that Bam Bam Quaid's part of, a little bit corny, you know, came out in their jeans and they've got the 80s shades on. They look like Joey Janela casualties, you know, that 80s retro thing, which I I don't really like retro stuff, 
generally. Anyway, I'm a bit funny about retro things. I, I I like going back and watching things, but kind of having retro stuff in the modern day, kind of like pixelated artwork in video games and that sort of thing. It just it, it turns me off a little bit. Um, this was two big lads having a good grapple. I mean, obviously Robert Dreisk is huge, and Bam Bam was a big big fella. Um, again, Quaid, little bit limited. You know, he wasn't somebody who I see particularly much in. Like, he he was competent. You know, he could clearly be a good base. He could take moves very well. Just a lot of what he does is quite unoriginal, really. So you see things like dusty elbows. You're not seeing any moves that are going to particularly uh, excite you or feel innovative. Um, I mean, he seems very young, so maybe this this is time to go and this you know, space for him to grow, because there's been space for every wrestler to grow and improve, isn't there? But at the minute, he's not somebody who I would be like, oh, this is someone we need to keep an eye on. You know, he, he, he's fine. Then we had a women's three-way. It was Baby Allison against Betty Rose against Alice Inc. Baby Allison, we obviously know from WXW. We're quite familiar with her. Uh, Alice Inc. is the big star um, from Body Slam. And then Betty Rose, I'm sure I know her. I'm sure I've seen her. I, think, I know she's Swedish, but um, let's have a look at a cage match. I know she's one of those wrestlers who I've seen pop up quite a bit in different places. You're know, like in probably in WXW. Uh, I mean, this match... Oh, no, seems to be Swedish. Maybe I don't know her. Uh, I wasn't impressed with her anyway, either way. Uh, I thought her character was amazing. Her charisma was amazing. You know, she comes out and she's tall. She's she's built, but she's very intimidating, but got that big smile to her face, which is that I love that dichotomy sometimes in wrestlers. And they're clearly very, very happy and very uh, happy-go-lucky. But if they wanted to batter you, they absolutely could. Um, unfortunately, this, this match, was there was too much poor work in it. You know, Betty Rose, very, very slow. You know, everything that she did was fine, but everything she did was 10 mile an hour slower than it should have been. A little bit confused as to why they chose to do a three-way with this as well, to be completely honest with you. It wouldn't have been something that I'd have chosen. Um, It just felt very clunky. Um, It felt like they had to... They had to adhere to those weird tropes that you have to adhere to in a three-way match where somebody falls out of the ring, where two work. Um, I liked Ink, um, and I liked Alice. There was a great spot in this where uh, Alice Ink was showing baby Allison how to do a better kick <laughs> on uh, Betty Rose, which I thought was a cool spot. She was saying, oh, no, no, don't kick like this, kick like this. You know, I, th- I thought that was really good. Um but generally, this this match was pretty bad. So we we got three for three of not being very good matches. But luckily, the show takes a bit of a turn with this next match. There's some things that I don't like about it, but we start to see an improvement. We've got Peter Olisander against Maggot. I've always been really conflicted about Maggot. I think he's really good. I do like him quite a lot. But he really does. He's on that tightrope into between good and bad kind of corniness. Do you know what I mean? He's he, I he's where's the crown of thorns and he's a bit edgy, he's a bit gimmicky. You know, he's got that sense and smell of the gimmick about him. Um and oh I I don't know. But then I, I watch him wrestle, then I, I think he's really good, you know, so I, I don't know, maybe, maybe he's on the right side of it. Uh, Peter Olisander, the gimmick's awful. The gimmick stinks. Um, he sees himself as a prophet, but the commentators were telling us that he's lost all of his um, followers, and he brings a book to the ring. I Again, it's that stench of the gimmick, isn't it? It's just, oh, I don't know if this is too much for me. It's a bit corny. It doesn't feel real. It doesn't feel like wrestling in the way that I want it to. Um, but the match itself was pretty decent. You know, they they, they had a really good match. Um, there was a spot in this that I'm conflicted about. Ollie Sanders, not losing, but he's struggling to find his feet and he goes away. 
and starts to look in his book. And again, that's just something that really highlights the fourth wall for me. It's kayfabe breaking, isn't it? It's it's suddenly like, oh, I'm not watching a contest here. I'm watching something that's been constructed, something that's fake. And generally, that's one of my turnoffs in wrestling. But on the other hand, <laughs> Maggot went away, grabbed the book off him, flicked through a bit, and clearly opened of the page, <laughs> a page that showed him how to do the corner punching. And he stands up and he's doing the one, two, three punch. And then he looks at the book and he goes, okay. He pauses and he goes, okay, now you're supposed to go, ooh, because he left a space and the audience went, ooh, and then he gave the last punch. And that actually made me laugh. So as much as I can criticise it for breaking kayfabe, for making me break that fourth wall, for making me feel a little bit awkward uh, and like it's not wrestling that I like that made me chuckle so maybe it was worth it <laughs> you know maybe it was all worth it in the end um I mean Peter was really good later on and he's a really good junior once the wrestling got going it was great you know it was all double stomps brutal big elbows and I like that and they built this match to a really great crescendo um again the WXW wrestler was central to this. You know, it, it felt like Body Slam was a step behind, which I, I suppose, to a certain extent, is true. You know, like, you know, the, the expected, I suppose, uh, for want of a better word. That's kind of what you would, what you go into this expecting. But there was a bit too much of a disparity here. Um there was a distraction finish as well to this. So I'm a little bit conflicted about this match. I thought they had some really good moments. But in a way, that's kind of why you want to watch promotions like this, isn't it? You watch them to get excited about them and to you know to have something new and interesting. Next, it was Toby Zane's birthday scramble. I'll kind of skip over this because it was what it was. Um, the only thing that I thought was weird about this match um, it was just it was all the young wrestlers coming in and having a bit of a scramble really and there was a there was a couple of bits that I thought were a bit corny but what was interesting there was a lot of the younger wrestlers here they were I'm surprised they didn't get a proper space on the card if I'm completely honest with you because a lot of these wrestlers were absolutely fantastic and a lot of them I thought were better than we were seeing on the card up until this point. You know, I thought Peter Phoenix was was okay, you know. Um, I thought Toby Zane himself was great, you know. I, I thought there was a lot of excitement, a lot of passion. They were clearly trying to do things that were that were exciting and, and trying to get the crowd going and the crowd behind them. So I thought it was a little bit strange that they didn't include that here. But, you know, there you go. It's what it is. Next up, we had Ahura against Carlos Zamora. Now, Zamora is the Body Slam champion. I really liked him. I was impressed with him. He had a good entrance. He had some reality to him. You know, he's a very good-looking bloke. He's somebody who came out and had a sense of, right, I'm here to have a serious wrestling match. Zamora, on the other hand, was a little bit... Sorry, a horror, excuse me, on the other hand. I'm going to do that all the way through this match, aren't I? I can sense it. A horror, on the other hand, a little bit cheesy you know he'd, he'd, he'd say, shout things at the crowd like i don't respect denmark you know and it's a bit you know when heels start talking about oh uh, you know I, I think your favorite sports team stinks you know ah, we all go boo and I, I think we're a little bit past that um do you know the best one of those i've ever seen was when i was a kid i was about 13 years old 14 years old and I went to a WWE house show in Manchester. And United had just won the um, Premier League. And Mick Foley tried to do that. He tried to say, hey, I hear your local sports team's pretty good. You know, it was like a babyface promo. And the whole arena booed him. Because uh, believe it or not, I don't think Manchester United are that popular in Manchester. But anyway, that's an aside. Um, I thought this match was really good. 
you know, Ahura did a huge spinning dive straight away and Zamora did a dive himself straight afterwards. And I thought, right, we're on here. You know, we're, we, we've got two wrestlers here who are going to really try and put on a show. You know, this they realise this could be a big thing for Body Slam. This is going to get them some fresh eyes on them and they're going to really go for it. And I respected that and I thought that was really good. This match had a great pace to it. You know, uh, Samara dodging and keeping up and it had to, just a rhythm that really good matches have. You know what I mean? Like the way good matches just have that pace to them that keeps going and going and going in a, in a, in a, in a kind of a rhythmic way, but in a, in a way that kind of takes you along with it. And it had that. Um, the work here was really competent all the way through. I thought Carlos Zamora was was a really good wrestler. He's the best wrestler from the Body Slam roster that I've seen so far. I can see why they've made him the champion. Um, the only bit in this match that I thought was a little bit weird is they... I'm going to say balcony, but it's not really a balcony. If you if you see a screenshot from the from the show, the ring's got kind of an elevated area behind it with a uh, a guardrail around it, and they went up there and they were wrestling. And the way they kind of filmed it, and the angle that they used, sort of gave the impression it was much higher than it was, which was weird because maybe this is a me problem because I've been watching it the whole time. Uh, and I knew how high it was because I'd literally seen it. But when they did the move where Zamora threw a horror off it, and they panned out and reminded me just how low down the balcony was, it kind of took me out of the match a little bit. I don't know why. It just it, it kind of, it made me feel a little. It made me feel a little bit like oh, like it was a bit comedic. You know, I, I I just wouldn't have done that balcony spot at all. Uh, but the match itself, I thought, was was really really good. Like I say, it had uh, a great um, adrenaline to it. There was a bit with some reverse pile drivers um, that was was great. Um, I thought this was a really solid match, and I think if you're going to watch one match off the show, maybe this one or the main event. The, I'm glad this happened because if I'm completely honest, by this point, I was perhaps ready to hand wave body slam a little bit. I wasn't seeing much in them that was going to make me really um, want to invest in them and, and, and get them going forward. But I, I, yeah, this this one got me, to be honest, this match. Next up, we have the Arrows of Hungary against Randers Pan. Um, I don't need to talk about how much I love the Arrows of Hungary. Um, and I'm, to my shame, I realised that I've not seen a match of theirs for a while. Um, I've, I've been sort of dipping in and out of WXW where they've been working a lot. And I've not gone back and caught up with HCW yet. But this is this show was the reminder to me that, hey, you really need to go back and catch up on these guys. Because they're to me, they're one of the most criminally underrated tag teams in the world. I think they're absolutely fantastic. I don't know why Red Pro are booking them more. I mean, that might be down to them. I mean, sometimes we assume, don't we, that Red Pro could just say, you know, I want to book you and, and get them in. Maybe they don't want to go all the way to the UK. Maybe it's a pain for Brexit reasons or what. I don't know. But I do wish I was seeing more Arrows of Hungary, and I'm going to make that my personal goal for this year. Randers Pan, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, but Randers Pan and Adonis and Xander, they kind of have the party boy gimmick, um, which is fine. It's not really ever a gimmick that I necessarily um, get into. Do you know what I mean? I, I, it's not necessarily a, a gimmick. You know, it feels a little bit like a, a shortcut, doesn't it, to a gimmick, you know, the party boy thing. But they certainly got over it in this match because they, they were they were great. You know, they, they were really, really good. Um there was a little bit in this, and I'm going to get this out of the way, that I think where the party boy gimmick went a little bit too far is when they do the dancing thing. So they had uh, Dover from the Arrows of Hungary. But they had one hold in each hand, and they're doing that wave dance move. And then Dover's looking shocked, like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm doing this. I wish I could stop dancing. And I, I don't want to do a shout about <laughs> about dancing on this show you know because i you know i've done that too many times over the past year it, it stinks doesn't it it's just it's not very good um 
this was just a really good bit of tag team action in this. You know, it was, you know, yeah, there was a little bit of dapping in, there was a little bit of dancing, but generally it was really great. Like some little moments with Icarus choking Xander and at the same time screaming in his tag team partner's face. You know, little bits like that, you know, hot attacks coming in, you know, getting the energy up, that sort of thing. When it broke down, the back sort of five, ten minutes of this was absolutely great. You know, Xander was great on the edge. Um, Arrows were great at letting them get that baby face come back. Great breakup of pins and big dives, and it was really cool towards the end. Um, I just think that that gimmick needs to be calmed down a little bit. I think you could do it on your entrance, you know, be the party guy on your entrance, but I think if it's easing itself into the match a little bit too much, then that's a little bit of a shame. So overall then, a bit of a mixed bag for my first look at Body Slam, but there was enough there to make me interested and make me want to watch a little bit more. I think the big thing for them has got to be getting their shows up within a reasonable time. Because I noticed, you know, they'll have a show at Christmas and it won't go up until months later. I mean, if I have a look on WXW, and I'm not sure because WXW, they've moved their... um, They've moved their thing over from their own website to youtube and i'm not a hundred percent sure if everything's over yet i know they're starting to upload things a lot and it's a little bit tricky because you kind of look at your playlist i'm still getting used to it um so yeah looking at it the last show that body slam have got up before this one is the 7th of may yeah, that's the that's the previous show. So we're talking, you know, seven months old. And they've had shows since then as well. You know, they've had that one. What was, there was one that was outside that I saw a, a preview of that I really wanted to watch. And Francisco Akira was on it. And uh, Emerson Jane was on it. Uh, and Enda Cara was on it. It looked really, really good. Um, but from what I can tell, you just can't see it. Um, certainly no way for me to see it anyway. Yeah, there's quite a few. There's a, hey, there's a burlesque music wrestling show as well. Wow, burlesque music. Uh, but yeah, just I think if it was a little bit more accessible, I think this is a promotion that I would probably watch, but it seems like they have to do a joint show with WXW to get things up in a reasonable time. So we'll see. It almost makes me wonder if it's worth filming. If you're not going to get it up for months later, then, then what's the point in filming it? Anyway, that's WXW and the Body Slab Show. Mixed bag. Um enjoyed it uh, this may come as a surprise as a surprise I should say to long time listeners uh, but I've made a mistake <laughs> earlier on we had another match another British and European match uh, that made the list for the uh, Voice of Wrestling match of the year at 181 it was Osprey against RKJ now I don't know if you remember my ranting at that match, but that was the match that caused me to upset my dog. Uh, I was shouting and ranting and raving so loudly that my dog got scared and went to his bed to hide from me, which made me feel absolutely terrible. And now I have to <laughs> have to rein myself in a little bit. Um, that was the match where there was lots of belt spots and ref distractions. And I found that really weird because didn't Meltzer give it five stars? But nobody else seemed to really like it. You know, all the others, like the, um, you know, like the Oku match and stuff like that, it, it got a real buzz going from it. But I seem to remember after the match itself, not many people seemed to be buzzing that much. And then nobody seemed to talk about the match afterwards. I mean, it's come 181st in the list, so it's clearly stuck in some people's heads. But to me, that was a match that could, could never, ever go. Um, be elevated to anything fantastic based purely on the ref distractions and the ref bumps and things like that. Um, it, it, it really marred it for me in a way that... that um, yeah, it did. Meltzer gave it five stars. I've got the cage match open here. Uh, 8.68. Um, what's that about? Um, four and a half. I thought that, yeah, I, I really, really didn't enjoy that match at all. I thought, I thought it was, it was, it was really weak, and I think that's been a bit of a theme for Ricky Knight Junior. this year. I think he's ended up being a little bit disappointing for me this year, 
I mean, he's a wrestler that I I love. I think if you're basing, you know, things purely on talent, if we're basing it purely on what somebody can do in the ring, then, you know, he's he's up there, isn't he? He's absolutely fantastic. But unfortunately, sometimes there's just often the booking with Red Pro hasn't done him justice. You know, he never really seemed to get on that run after winning the belt. And yes, a lot of that was 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 injury and a lot of that was perhaps things that were outside of their control. But I, this title run's been a bit of a letdown, I think. I think what they need is a little bit of a... Um, of a reset for him. I mean, having a look through Cage Match now at his uh, at his title defenses, we've got him beating Will Ospreay. We had the match against Gabriel Kidd in Southampton, which I thought was okay. And then the match against Yota Suji, and the match against Nathan Cruz, and the match against his brother. I mean, were any of them really great? I mean, the Yota Suji one was, was okay. I thought the Nathan Cruz one was decent. I've got a feeling that was a replacement at the last minute. I thought the Nathan Cruz one was okay. Uh, but it's Nathan Cruz, so there's always going to be a, there's always going to be a, um, a ceiling, isn't there? Um, but yeah, no great match there, is there? Which is a real shame, because you think Gabriel Kidd and Yota Suji really had a chance to set himself up for something really great. So I'm hoping a little bit of time away um, he can come back this year and have a great title run. You know, I think that's what ultimately what he needs more than anything is that little bit of space. Okay, a little bit of a quiet fortnight this fortnight, so a little bit of a shorter episode. Uh, we're going to be back in two weeks' time. We're going to get ourselves caught up on um, WXW. Uh, they've got quite a few shows at the minute uh, that I'm really excited about. Uh, we'll have a little bit of Red Pro to talk about. Uh, we should, hopefully, if everything goes right, have their Live in Southampton show and their Live in London 70 uploaded, uh, both of which have got some pretty interesting matches on. Um, a big part of the this stuff for the Red Pro at the minute is this open challenge that they've done. Uh, with Leighton Buzzard getting an Osprey match, which which is very strange. Uh, but that Southampton show has got a couple of tasty looking matches on it. It's got, um, let me scroll down here, I just had it open. It's got Yota Suji against Leon Slater. That's a match I really want to see. And Dan Maloney against Luke Jacobs, they're finally doing that Maloney-Jacobs match. Now, the only thing that could ruin that match for me is potentially if they wrap it up in the bollocks. You know, like, who's cruiserweight, who's heavyweight, all that nonsense. But you know, as soon as the bell goes, it's going to be a fantastic match. All right, thanks very much for listening. I'll see you again in a couple of weeks' time for more about the British and European wrestling scene. (laughs) 